we'll see. Tonight we're going to go and do, a back, uh, do the introduction into the book of Galatians. So let's open our Bibles. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 1. And all we're going to do is read the portion of Paul's salutation as he enters into it. And uh, read verses 1 through um, 5. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace our God and the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Aren't you glad he did that for us? That he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We've got a precious, precious salvation, and we've got the responsibility to not neglect so great salvation. But we're going to be looking at this. Let me, let me go ahead and give you my title slide because I want to address something on it. We're going to be talking about when cultures conflict with Christianity, when culture conflicts with Christianity. And so we're just going to do a background, some things connected to it, what was going on in those things to set the, the direction for the book of Galatians. Pray for your pastor. That's your pastor's heart. I'm telling you honestly, I want to communicate the things of the Word of God faithfully. I don't want to be in error. I want the Holy Ghost, to, even in the middle of my Bible study, to lead me and direct me to be able to do things that's uh, not in my notes, but, but things that may be necessary to you. Pray that the Lord speaks to you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for truth. Thank you for this great gospel that was once delivered to the saints. Pray that you would help me this evening. As we take this and we, we break open this book, uh, touch us with it. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you, Lord. Mm. Somebody say amen. amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. God bless you and you may be seated. <clears throat> so when culture conflicts with Christianity, and boy, if that's not true of today, you tell me when it has been true. We are facing a huge uh, culture gap between the world and the church. There's been times past when the church affected the culture of a nation, but, but uh, we're, we're living in a different day now. There's tremendous pressure against the church to become more and more like the world, and we don't want that because we want to be true to the gospel that has been delivered to us. Amen. So, we get, we're going to get into background. We're going to get into some conceptualized things, talking about why Paul ended up writing this letter to the churches, not just church, but a region uh, called Galatia. Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem. Now, what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is literally saying that what it, what it was was the promise that there was going to become a Messiah. It was a part of the Jewish people and the Jewish faith. This didn't come out of Buddhism. didn't come out of some other kind of ism. It came out of, of Jewish uh, faithfulness throughout all those years. And it, that's, that's where it came from. That's our roots. Even in today's society, we talk about a Christian uh, Judeo roots. So we go back into that and we, we find our uh, early concepts of Christianity all the way back into the Old Testament. But the message, even though it started with the Jews, it was not only for the Jews, but it was for all humanity. And aren't we glad that it is? Next Sunday, we'll celebrate uh, um, the Gentile Sunday. All Nation Sunday, and the fact that all of us could be here if you didn't have Jewish lineage, and we don't know now, we're so all 
mixed up as Heinz 57s. We don't know what we got and what we don't have. Uh, some of you that think you're Hispanic, you go ahead and get a DNA. You'll find out what you really are. But anyway, so it started with Jerusalem. It started there, but it didn't mean to stop there. All the way, all the way back into Abraham's day, it was looked forward to that the church was going to go beyond the borders of Judah uh, and Jerusalem and go to the entire world. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Uh, Jesus said it. This is a companion scripture to Matthew 28, 19. If you don't have that written down in your Bibles, you need to because everybody that takes you to uh, Matthew 28, 19, it says you've got to be baptized like that. This is a parallel scripture to that. And so Luke rep recorded it saying that repentance and remission of sins, what is that? Baptism. baptism. Somebody say baptism. baptism. Repentance of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was the beginning point, but it was not to stop there. It was to go around the world to all nations. And then we go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You're going to receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You shall be witness unto, witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, who they considered a half-breed people, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. So the promise that was going to be delivered was not just to those that call, were called God's chosen people, but now he has taken the gospel into a brand new aspect, and it is to whosoever will. And I'm glad to be a part of that group. But you've got to look at what God did to begin with on the day of Pentecost. 17 diverse languages and cultures experienced Pentecost that day. There was men from everywhere, people, because Jerusalem was a crossroads of commerce. It was a place where everybody would go. And so on this holy day, you have people there for merchandise. You have people there for the, for the show. And you have devout people from everywhere. And you have all of that. Acts chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And now we hear every man in our own tongue where we were born. Perinthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judah, Judea, Cappadonia, Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, Phygra, Phygra, Pamphylia, in Egypt, uh, in parts of Libya and about Serene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. He said, we do hear them speak in tongues the wonderful works of God. And what a marvelous time that would be. And we've given you illustrations, people receiving the, the Holy Ghost, someone else being able to understand it in their own natural language, and to, to hear them praising God in the sweetest, most innocent, pure way that came out of them. You don't have to worry about what you're doing when you're speaking in tongues. When you have yielded yourself to God, when you've yielded yourself to the Lord and that act of faith has brought you into that place, I promise you, you will be glorifying God with your tongue. So this is what's taken place. Because of this, 17 different nations that are being represented, they went back to their homes. They told this experience where they came from. For example, you go to after the Samaritan revival that takes place, and God just blows people's minds, allowing these filthy Samaritans to receive the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, help us to reach some brand new people. And let the Samaritans reach, receive the Holy Ghost. And then right after that, he takes the main evangelist, drags him down to Gaza, which is in war right now, and it was the Ethiopian eunuch. He had been up there to Jerusalem. He was a devout man in the fact that he was fascinated, believed in Judaism, 
but he was going back to Ethiopia. He was the treasurer for the queen, and from that, conver- that experience, when he took the scroll, read to him out of the book of Isaiah, explained to him what he was reading that was as prophetic about Jesus Christ, told the story of Jesus, he baptized him on that road that day. It was from that experience that the gospel went into Ethiopia. I listened to something very fascinating in the last week about a, a individual who was, uh, they were kind of discouraging people believing in Christianity, especially among the black people. They said, how can you believe in a God that is a Western white man's concept and uh, has been thrust upon you because of colonialism in the last two, three hundred years. And he said, ma'am, I don't know where you got your facts from, but he said, I am from Africa. And Christianity went to Africa 2,000 years ago. And our people have been believing in Christianity long before it ever came to Europe or America. Whoa. Yeah. The reach of the gospel was so great, all because of that influential man that went down there. So it began to spread rapidly throughout Israel and beyond. Uh, By the time that Paul is becoming a missionary, it's possible that there was as many non-Jews as there were Jewish people that were a part of Christianity at that time. And it it was spreading like wildfire. Uh, The the book of Acts talked about those that have turned the world upside down, have come hither also. Now, we're going to go in and we're going to start showing you the relevance of this, how that this message was being spread around the world. But prior to Acts chapter 15 and what we refer to as the first Jerusalem council, that infamous or famous council uh, in chapter 15. Prior to that, Paul had preached in, number one, Tarsus. This is not Tarsus. That is over near Spain. Tarsus, and I meant to put a map in here. I apologize. Right above Jerusalem, is nowadays the the country of Lebanon. It is old Syria. Okay, somebody say Syria. It's where the Assyrians lived. Uh, It is in that place that the city called Antioch of Syria was located. Around the bend on the Mediterranean Sea, not all that far from there, is this city called Tarsus, and it is in the area called Cappadonia, Cappadonsi, and Cappadon, help me out. Anyway, in that region of the country, and this, this is his homeland. So Paul first goes back home to his own people and begins to preach there. Second all, he went to then, he went back around to Syrian Antioch. And I'm making a point here because there is two Antiochs in the scripture and they're not to be confused. So he goes back around to Syrian Antioch. This is the location where they were first called Christians. You with me? It's directly north of Jerusalem or over by the coast. And it was there, he spent a few years, and it was from that location that Paul and Silas were commissioned and sent, and that word is is the same place we get the word apostle from, because the word apostle means to be sent, and they sent them out as missionaries. And from that, they travel over to a couple of islands inside of the, the Mediterranean Sea, after they visit those, those islands were the home region of Silas. So they pass through that, and then they go up to Antioch again. This is not the same Antioch as Antioch of Syria. This is Pisidia, and it is, along with the other three, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. These four cities are in the area of of Galatia. 
So on his first missionary journey, he establishes the churches in Galatia. Now, he's going to minister to some more later on in his missionary journeys. But this was his foothold and his most important work at that time in those cities. And so he has, he has traveled there. Uh, it is in that region. Now, it's interesting. I, you know, did my background work want to carry you uh, enough information that you can grab a hold of things? The word Galatia actually comes from the word Gauls, G-A-U-L-S. The Gauls were the, the warlike people that were most notably connected with Spain, France, and England. When you think of the Celts, you know, the Celtic cross, yada, 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 all the Druids and all that kind of stuff, those were the Gauls. They were a warlike tribe. They, they loved to fight. That's just part of who they were. Well, there was a group of them, about 180,000 of them, that went down into northern Turkey. To, to fight against Alexander the Great. And while they were down there, they started living there long enough, they, they actually had their retreat cut off, and they ended up living in northern Turkey. And this region, it went from there, and it had a part that went down to the Mediterranean Sea, is what became known as Galatia. So that's where it's at. Now, after the missionary team had arrived back in Syrian Antioch, it was that men from Judea arrived teaching. This is important that you understand. The essentiality of traditional Judaism as a foundation of Christianity. This is what they were saying. They were saying the reason the gospel came to us first is because we obey the law. When Peter, James, and John, and the, the apostles, the others, received the Holy Ghost, they did not quit living their Jewish lifestyle. I want that to sit in or sink into you for a little bit. They were practicing Jews. What did they do in Acts chapter 3? It was time of prayer. And so where were they? They were going to the temple to pray. And it was at that time at the Gate Beautiful that they met the lame man and a miracle took place. Did they pray at home? Yes, they prayed at home because when Peter was in prison, there was a group in a home praying. Okay? Peter gets out of prison. He shows up at the door. They're praying for his deliverance and can't believe that God did what God did. It's an amazing thing. But yet they still were faithful to the Jewish holidays. They were faithful to all those things. They kept those things up. It was not until Peter had a revelation of some things that that changed. Uh, now, one of the things that happened, persecution spread the gospel. Now, I looked it up. I, I asked for the timeline of persecution of the early Christians, and they wanted to start it in A.D. 64 when Nero charged the Christians with burning the city of Rome, blamed them because it was actually fires he set himself. He martyred Christians and set their bodies on fire on posts and lit around the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they think that, that was it. But the reality of it is was that persecution had began in Jerusalem long before it spread to Rome and the other parts of the world. They were being persecuted, such as the killing of uh, James the Greater, James the first disciple or apostle that was there. The brother of John uh, was killed in Jerusalem back during those times. 
And, and, and that's why uh, they turned around and imprisoned Peter because they felt like that made the Jews happy that he, they killed some of these people. So they were going to do it again. And so persecution took place. The church was growing rapidly in Jerusalem. By 45 to 48 A.D., after the death of Jesus Christ, you're seeing tremendous persecution being on the church. That is only about 15 years after the birth of of the church. They estimate 30,000 converts in the city of Jerusalem alone. It's a pretty good sized home missions work. Pretty successful work. It was and and because of that it spread around, but persecution followed them and and a lot of it was because of the persecution from the Jews. Let's go on. So this conflict of cultures, what are you talking about, this conflict? Judaism versus Christianity. Because Jews believed in a Messiah, they just were not ready to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They rejected him as their Messiah. So they, these people have come from this Judaistic mindset. You've got these Gentiles that pray through that have no understanding of the Old Testament law. Zilch, none. They've been worshiping idols. They've been pagans. They don't know anything about it. And you have this old historic Christ, uh, Jewish culture clashing with this new culture that has come out of paganism. And so this is what it finally came to a head in Acts chapter 15. Historically, the converts to Christianity were primarily from one nation, and that was from Israel. They were practicing Jews, and uh, as commanded in the Mosaic law, they did circumcision, they ate kosher, and that just doesn't mean a certain kind of dill pickles. It means you didn't eat pork, you didn't, you know, do certain things. You didn't eat um, a, a, some meat and boiled in the milk of its mama. You didn't do those things, all those kosher laws that they kept. And they observed the Sabbath. But you've got people out there that have never been around Christian or Jew, Judaism that they don't know anything about the Sabbath. It didn't mean anything to them. So we have this conflict that is, that is going on. Many, there were many Jewish Christians, and, and in the book of Acts chapter 15, it records them as being converted Pharisees. What were the Pharisees? They were so concerned with every little tiny detail of the law that they ended up adding a bunch of laws to the laws to, dis to explain the laws, and it got to the place where nobody could keep it. So they believe that non-Jews need to truly to become a part of God's covenant family. They need to obey the laws of Moses as well. And so you've got this council at Jerusalem. The apostles have gathered together. Paul has been called to be a part of this, and these Judaizers, these Pharisees that were converted, were insisting that they, that they be circumcised. So here is the foundation of the reason for this council at Jerusalem. This issue right here is going to become one of the number one things that Paul fights as a heresy in the first century church. You have another major heresy called Gnosticism. That word means hidden knowledge or hidden wisdom. And there are people that feel like that they have a hidden biblical code that nobody else can understand except for those that have magic glasses. Whatever. They, they feel like there's some kind of mystics that are better ever, than everybody else. And so they have this understanding, and it conflicts clearly with the Word of God. It's, it's, it's still here today. We call it New Age Ideas, theology. 
And so you've got those that follow all of that kind of stuff thinking they got something new. It's not new. It's Gnosticism pulled back all the way from the first century. So you have different errors that are cropping up. Eventually, when you get on down into the second century, you're going to find Trinitarianism beginning to creep its way into Christianity because prior to that, no one baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Before that, they did not describe God as three. They only understood one thing. There is only one God, and we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all they knew back in that time. So you get these heresies that start entering into the church. So they're beginning to insist, command, command everybody that they've got to be uh, uh, circumcised. And if you don't know what that means, we can have a class afterwards. But believe me, for a grown male, that would be a tremendously painful process. There's a reason when you go back into Acts 15, 17, wherever it's at, when you go back into that, when, when Abraham was commanded of the Lord to circumcise his son at the age of eight days old, there was a purpose for that particular day because for a male child on the eighth day after they're born, their blood count drops low and it is God's time that he prepared them for such a thing as circumcision. While they were small, while they didn't understand those things, while they didn't have all the other issues to go along with it, it was a typology, saints of God, of what? cutting off of the excess flesh because inside of the excess flesh there could be disease that was harbored there that could be passed from the male to the female. That disease killed hundreds of thousands if not millions of people that were not believing saints of God uh, or Jews. When God commands something, he's doing it for your sake. But that type back then was to us today a different situation because we're going to get into the revelation. We're going to talk about it in the book of Galatians. What Paul is talking about, looking at, is what God is wanting. That was a schoolmaster. It was an example to teach us in this time of the church age that we have got to cut off our fleshly nature of the heart. You cannot live for God and stay filthy and dirty in the world. You cannot do that. They're incompatible. You will kill people if you hold on to fleshly, worldly ideas and try to be a Christian at the same time. <laughs> Baptism is an outward sign of an inward act. What are you doing? You're saying, I'm dying to the flesh. I don't want to live that way anymore. Somebody help me out now. I feel like I'm in a sticky point, but you've got to grasp what I'm telling you because you've got, you got people that will take grace unto lasciviousness. They will take the understanding, the concept of grace and the liberty that we're going to talk about in the book of Galatians, and they will move that to saying you can live any way you want to live. This is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And there's people that try to move that into the apostolic church and try to move away from holiness and say that we can do these things because we have liberty. They are uncircumcised in the heart. It's the issue. That's the issue. So Peter rose up in Acts chapter 15. Let me get back to the book. Uh, Peter rose up and uh, with his wisdom, he began to talk to him. He began to relate to them how his conversion began, how the conversion of the Gentiles began. And he makes the statement here in chapter 15, God made the choice among us. 
This is not my decision. It's not one something I went out to do. God made the choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's saying this is what God directed me to do. And when they did, he reminded them, they received the same Holy Ghost in the same manner as they did in the upper room. That same speaking with other tongues, that same joy unspeakable, that same experience fell on the Gentiles and they received the same glorious experience. Couldn't deny it. Then he summed it up with, with these words. He, he gave it to him. He said in Acts 15 and verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples. What are they after? They're after making the disciples circumcise the converts. He said, why would you put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You're going to make them go out there and make Jews out of the pagans so that they can legitimize this Christian experience. <clears throat> I'm glad that right now that water is not as dirty as it was on Sunday. <clears throat> so, and I'm shortening the conversation tremendously for time's sake. James <clears throat> here is now the apparent leader of the apostles. This is not the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. I'm trying to think. Anthony, where are you at? Anthony? Let's see, then there's, there's Anthony uh, Zuniga. And, wait a minute, that's Anthony Zuniga. You don't know how sometimes that messes up our accounting. And then we've got Anthony Rojas who we affectionately usually call Rojas. And, you know, because we have more than one with the same name. That's exactly what happens at times in the scriptures. And if you don't take the time to divide out what's going on, you'll think that somehow the James that got killed earlier in Acts come back to life again. That's not what took place. So James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, uh, he speaks like the statesman that he was, and he, this leader of the council, gives some, some direction. He provides this decision. Verse 14, Simon, who is Simon? Peter. Now, we're, gonna, we're also going to see him in the book of Galatians, referred to as Cephas. So Simon is called Cephas, and he also was nicknamed Peter, by Jesus. So he says, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles and to take out of them a people for his name. What was he talking about? He was talking about that time that he had a heavenly vision and he saw that that sheet coming down, a huge blanket more or less, coming down out of heaven and had all manner of unclean beasts in it. And a voice from heaven spoke and said, slay and eat, kill and eat them. And he said, not me, Lord, because they're not kosher. Those don't fit in the Mosaic law. And he is, he is retaining his understanding of integrity. But God speaks to him and says, What I have cleansed, call thou not unclean. you got to understand how hard that was for a dyed-in-the-wool Jew to say God spoke to me and said, I could eat some pig. I can have bacon and pork chops. I can have catfish. I don't know what all was in that sheet, but the Lord said he could eat some of those things. And, and then he went on and told him, you're about to have a visitor. This visitor is going to ask you to go with him, and uh, you're going to go, and you're going to present the gospel at this man's house. This man was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. 
but he was hungry for God. I've got to be careful. I, I've got to be so careful because I do not want to equate some of this that I'm teaching to certain things. But there are other things that our mindsets may prevent us from reaching out to people that we are uncomfortable with. If tradition is preventing us from reaching those, we got to get through some, some, some things. Hang on with me because we're going to take a journey. And in that, we're not going to let down the message. We're not going to let down the hole in the standards. We're not going to let down those things. But we've got to fully understand some things. Because if you don't get a good grasp of some teaching out of the Word of God, some slick speaking, I'm trying to be kind. He's going to call himself a man of God, is going to come and tell you things, and you're going to believe him and be swayed in it simply because you are not rooted and grounded. If I simply give you candy stick scriptures, if I give you our favorite little places and things, and you don't have enough teaching and understanding of more difficult passages, you're going to be swayed just like the spirit in the end time, the Antichrist is going to come with lying wonders and all of those things. You better have a good grasp on what you believe and why you believe it. Okay? What happened in Peter's situation? Cornelius, what happened with that? Well, lo and behold, while he was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell. Same thing as in the upper room. John, or James says, this is what Peter was talking about when Cornelius and that group received the Holy Ghost. Verse 15, and to this agreed the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. I will build up again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. Oh, there's so much good information. Somebody say the tabernacle of David. Say it one more time. It is not to be confused with the temple of Solomon. David never built a temple. He didn't build one. What was David's tabernacle? It was the fact that he brought the ark to Jerusalem and there was open worship and praise in the presence of the ark of the covenant which typified the presence of God. When he said, I will rebuild it, he was not talking about the building of a temple again. He said, I'm going to reach back there and get a hold of what David had and I'm going to reestablish it and you're going to see that, that key that David had, that understanding of worship, that man after my own heart. Oh, I feel like, I feel the Holy Ghost upon me, saints of God, but I'm telling you, what we have in the Holy Ghost is that tabernacle of David reestablished in the church. Now, he said, I'm going to set it up, verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things? And then he goes on down. He says some things right after that. But I'm going to jump down towards a little further in chapter where he sums it up a second time. There are some things that the council decided is non-negotiables. You disciples, when you go out there and convert the Gentiles... We're not going to ask you to circumcise them. We're not going to tell you that they've got to keep the Sabbath. We're not going to tell you that they have got to quit eating pork. But there are four things that they have to observe. Let's get into that. Acts 15 and verse 28. For it seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Then it goes into four things. Number one, we want you to abstain from meat that is offered to idols. Now Paul is going to have a discussion, I think in the book of Romans, where Paul is going to literally say, what does it matter? 
There's going to be a weaker brother that says, well, that meat was offered to an idol. And Paul is going to say, well, that idol is nothing. Is Paul trying to contradict? Paul is simply saying, don't go so hyper that you have got to ask everybody, did this hamburger come in contact with any idols? What market did you buy this hamburger from? Okay? He's saying, don't ask some questions for your conscience sake. But yet in the same context, he's going to teach them, he's going to tell them. Now, if, they, if they're going to make an issue out of it and tell you, we went down and, and we bowed down before Diana and we offered this meat to Diana first and now we want to sell it to you, then he said, reject it. What's going on? What's the difference? It's because there's no devil in the meat. The devil is in that individual and them trying to force their theology and ideology on you. He said there's a time to take a stand. Anyway, stain for meat offered to idols. Number two, from blood. From blood. I'm going to come back to this. Number three, three things that are strangled. And number four, from fornication. Number one and number four are pretty obvious. Things offered to idols. In reality, all four of these have to do with idolatry worship. All four. What they are saying to the disciples is you have got to make them understand they cannot keep their idolatry and Christianity at the same time. You've got to separate yourself from idolatry. So when it talks about blood, what they would literally do was this is part of animalism, which is still practiced in places of Africa, and I don't know if maybe in other parts of the world, but they believed back in the book of Genesis, the scripture that says the life is in the blood. Okay? So they believed that if you wanted the strength of a lion, you go kill a lion, and while that lion is still pumping out his life's blood, you capture that blood and you drink that blood so that you can get the spirit of that animal inside of you. That's idolatry. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's animalism. It's, it's, a, it's an early form of idolatry. The same concept went with things that were strangled because in that, all right, let's get gross. If you haven't eaten supper and your stomach's queasy, just go ahead and step out right now. You go get a chicken. And those, those old mamas knew how to wring its neck until its head popped off. And then they let it run around the barnyard. Well, whatever it was doing. But it was pumping the blood out. And they would drain the animal so that all of the blood would come out of that. And then they would cook it. But the Hedons, what they believed is that if you would strangle that animal until it died and kept the blood in the body, that when you ate it, the same thing with the other from blood, you were getting that into your body. All right? It's another form of idolatry. And fornication. Number one, you know that it is the lust of the flesh. It is, it is uh, relations outside of the boundaries of marriage and all of that. But you've got to remember how, how much of the idol worship was connected to prostitutes around their temples. That was a part of their thing. And as much as it may have been a part of their culture, he's saying don't participate in what they're doing. Somebody say Halloween. Ooh, I, I just hit you there, didn't I? I just slipped it. I just, oh, Brother Bodie, they're just having fun, dressing up like devils and witches and scary, you know. Why are you celebrating the devil? 
I personally believe that if they had been celebrating Halloween back then, that would have been number five on the list because it fits the same concept, folks. We got to understand we're not doing it just by the mere letter of the law. We're doing it by the heart that is behind it. We're doing it because God, we want to draw near God and obey God. And so there's things that we don't do. That's why we have a harvest party is to give them a safe place and an alternative so that they're not out there with spooks and goblins and every evil thing that is in the world. Somebody say amen. And then he finished it up saying from which if you keep yourselves, you're going to do well. Just do these things. And, and he left it like that. That was the end of the council in Acts chapter 15. Apparently. It was after this first apostolic council that the Judaizers made their way into Galatia. Paul is on other missionary journeys. Paul is traveling in other places. And these guys, the book of Galatians is going to say, they crept in and began to teach and spread their hybrid faith. The blending of Judaism and Christianity, and they were telling these, gen, these Gentiles that it was essential. Paul finds out. Paul gets upset. He gets angry. He's heartbroken, and he wrote this letter, the book of Galatians, in response, challenging the Galatians to a summary of the gospel message of the crucified Messiah. Don't forget what he did for you. Don't forget the relationship, the power of the gospel. He argues that this gospel is what created the new multi-ethnic family of God. Not just Jews, but Greeks, Romans, Gentiles, to whosoever will. And that's what gives you and I the ability to be transformed from our old life into this glory experience uh, uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost. And we've got to bring it to a close, but there's two things that while we get into the book of Galatians, you need to keep these two things in mind. These things, these subjects are going to keep popping out of the book of Galatians. Number one, the works of the law. Somebody say the works of the law. Don't forget, when we talk about the works of the law, we are talking about the Mosaic law, not somebody trying to do away with our apostolic heritage. We're going to be talking about Christian liberty. We're going to talk about your freedom in Christ. And this is where some have taken the Word of God and misapplied it, not rightly dividing the word of truth, and made it say something that it was not meant to say. This book was not written so that you could be set free from standards. I just want that to be very clear, because while we go through it, I want you to know there is a difference between the Mosaic Law and our apostolic heritage and what we have in the church. So, number one, you're going to look at the works of the law. Number two is our faith in Jesus Christ. And we are, we are firmly in agreement that we're not here by our works. We're here by the faith of Christ. There's not enough money to buy your way into heaven. There's not enough goodness, not enough prettiness. You can't win enough modeling uh, contracts to win your way into the kingdom of God. You're not good enough. You never will. But thank God in the midst of my sin, he reached out for me. So we're going to be talking about our faith. Number, and then we got to ask the question, we're going to be talking about freedom, but freedom from what? What are we being set free from? And then the second thing is, is what is, is, are we being set free from works of righteousness? Now that's a rhetorical question because it's an obvious answer. God is not trying to set us free from living righteous lives. All right. Now let me give you a little historical context 
as it matters in Christianity in the last 2,000 years. Martin Luther, I had, a, I had a lithograph one time hanging in my office, and unfortunately, a uh, truck came by one day and shook it, and the old, old wood in there, the, the nail came out, and it fell and crashed, splintered the glass, shattered the, the lithograph and that, that, um, that fragile paper that was there and destroyed the picture. But it was of Martin Luther in his pulpit. And I had a guy come in there and look at that picture one time and said, I thought he was black. <laughs> that was Martin Luther King, not Martin Luther. Martin Luther was referred to as the father of the Reformation because he, he nailed 95 theses on the door of the, of the uh, chapel at Worm, uh, and so yada, yada, yada. He loved the book of Galatians. It was his favorite of all of the books of uh, the epistles. But he felt like that the book of James should not have been included in the canon of scriptures. What is the word canon of scriptures? That is the 66 books that are bound in your Bible. That is referred to as the canon of scriptures. He felt like it should have been left out. And the reason he felt like it should have been left out was because it didn't agree with his theology. And so if you don't, if you don't, if you find things that don't agree with your theology, you just take your knife and cut them out. He called it a straw gospel. Going back on the, the concept when Paul said you need to build on the foundation silver, gold, precious stones, but if it's wood, hay, and stubble, straw, it's going to be burnt up. He literally felt like this was a, a, a spurious work that ought to have been destroyed. Now, the reason is because Galatians strongly stresses justification by faith, not by the works of the law. True, it is right. While James says, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Which one of them's right, which one of them's wrong? Well, if you've got a revelation of what they're saying, neither one of them are. The two are not incompatible. They fit together like hand and glove. They go together beautifully because they're both true. What did Martin Luther have wrong? Martin Luther was taking the book of Galatians to try to reform the Catholic church, not dealing with Judaism. He was taking it and make it talk about and deal with things that had nothing to do with the original writing of the book of Galatians. And so that's the reason you have that conflict within somebody like that. I'm glad that we're not trying to reform the Catholic Church. We went back all the way and just restored what was there in the first place. We're restorationists, not reformists. We went back to the gospel of Jesus Christ and dug it out, out of the book, and that's where our faith is at which is why we're not Trinitarians. So, we are saved by works. Or we are not saved by works, excuse me, but we are saved unto good works. Our good works are proof of our changed nature. When you, when you have it on the inside, it's going to reveal itself on the outside. It will come out inside of you and... and uh, you won't have to be told to love your wives. You'll just do it because it's just your spirit. You, just, you won't have to be told to forgive. You'll just forgive because you understand God forgave you. You won't have a problem with mercy because God was so merciful to you. God, give us that innocence. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to delve into that, but that's a brief background on the book, and it's not near the material that I covered to prepare and get ready for this. I just had to say, nope, I can't do that. Nope, I can't do that. Got to break it down where we can handle it. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, set our things aside, and then let's throw our hands in the air and let's love the Lord. Let's thank Him for our salvation. Thank Him.